Now, joining me now for more on the markets and the economy in the light of the latest details coming out of Europe as to their debt crisis, we have Arnab Kumar Banerjee. He is a former chief economist and advisor to former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He is now the chief investment officer of Calabrium Capital. Arnab, good to have you with us on Bloomberg. Thanks for coming in. Based on the information that you have about the various solutions that European governments are putting together, do you see a conflict between what Germany is willing to do and what France wants? Yes, of course there is a conflict and I think the, the resolution is taking, it's taking so long simply because of the compromises that have to go to, through. Uh, essentially the Germans are the principal creditor of Europe and uh, they have the money they have the money they have the, that, that's it essentially and uh, they want to limit their exposure whereas France would prefer uh, that it's a collective exposure of the whole of Europe uh, that it is the whole of Europe that uh, helps Greek through, uh, Greece through its problems and supports the other vulnerable countries within the Union now currently it seems as though there is the European Financial Stability Facility the EF SF. And there was a report today that there is something else. It's called the ESM, the European Stabilization Mechanism. And they are looking to transition the, e the EFSF, that program, into an ESM. There are a lot of acronyms here. By July of 2013, do you really think that that kind of time frame addresses investor concerns right now? That doesn't. And actually, there's a lot of talk about bringing the ESM forward into next year and conflating it with the EFSF. Um, so one will go, but the two may be joined together or at least uh, uh, superimposed on each other. Now, there's only speculation on that. The real firepower would come if the EFSF was used with its 440 billion uh, um, uh, facility, was used to leverage uh, the firepower of the union. Now, the way that would happen is there are a number of ways but, uh, that are being debated, but one way would be for it, for instance, to insure uh, bonds, take the first 20 percent of any loss on uh, uh, money lent to others. And that, in theory, could expand the firepower of this facility to one or two trillion, depending on how much has already been committed. And there's a lot of debate going on about this. Now, you talk about leveraging this fund, this European Financial Stability Facility. How would they actually go about leveraging it? Because that seems to be doing the very thing that got them into the problem in the first place, which is just adding more debt. How can you solve a debt problem by borrowing more? Well, you've got a very good point there, but the way around that is, I think the term they would use is guarantee. If they took 20% of the loss the, that uh, a, a lender might have, the first 20% up to that, then of course, when we say leveraging, it's an insurance facility. And what they're saying to the lenders is that if you give uh, um, Greece or some other country in the future, after its finances have been reorganized alone, then we will take the first 20% of the hit. And it's very unlikely, therefore, to be needed. So in some, I mean, when we say leverage, we mean that it allows the private sector to give much bigger loans. Now, there is a possibility that the, the uh, principal equity might be used to borrow from the ECB, uh, the European Central Bank. This is something that the French have suggested, something that the Germans are dead against. So we come back to insurance. Uh, it's not exactly leverage in the form of debt being given out, but rather in the form of a guarantee. Commitments that they don't necessarily hope will ever be used. Exactly. If it's big enough and it's a shock and awe strategy, then they hope not to have to actually spend too much of it. All right, Arnav, I'll just hang on to one second because I want to bring in Christina Romer, professor of economics at UC Berkeley, also a Bloomberg contributing editor. She's also the former chairman of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Professor Romer, good to have you with us. You've been listening to Arnav describe what the situation is in Europe and some of the potential solutions to the European debt crisis. If you were a policymaker in Europe, what would be your suggestions for this six day meeting? Well, I think the, the biggest picture is just this sense of urgency and how important it is that they do come up with a definitive solution. I think what we have seen time and again is sort of halfway solutions that put a Band-Aid on the problem and don't solve it. And I think what we are seeing in you know the worldwide economic slowdown, uh, all of that is just exactly the, the confidence effect that this, this festering problem is having uh, on certainly the European 
European economy and, and by, uh, by its effects on the rest of the world. So I think the main thing I would be saying is, for heaven's sakes, agree to something and agree to something big. Christina Romer, you heard Arnab talking about a shock and awe policy, the idea being that the amount of money that might be considered for some kind of debt restructuring or insurance program has to be big. What kind of number are we talking about? Oh, I think there, there are people that are much more expert than I am on this, but I think he's exactly right that, you know, exactly what I was saying before is that we have, have consistently, the Europeans have been consist consistently doing too little. And so I think now is the time for something that convinces the world, convinces world financial markets that they are going to deal with Greece, they're going to deal with the countries in immediate trouble, they're going to ring fence uh, Spain and Italy, and they are going to actually deal with this. So Arnab, the number you're you, talking about is, of course, huge. All right. Well, Arnab, when you take a look at the Greek economy right now, in, uh, new estimates are that the economy is even worse shape than previously thought and that they're going to need something on the order of 250 billion euros by the end of the decade. Are European policymakers really willing to stump up that kind of money for an 11 million population economy? I think at the end of the day, we have to understand that Greece can't continue with its debt burden, um, either in terms of simple arithmetic or morally. You can't ask an economy to hand over all its growth and some more every year to the bankers. It just doesn't work. So part of the, the solution is to reduce Greek debt. Now, it's been mooted that 50% of their debt will be cut off. When that happens, if it's combined with reforms, then Greece can sustain uh, sustainably services debt. If that's the case, then nothing more would need be done except a guarantee. So what we're talking about is not the flows that the government will provide, which it may be necessary in extremists, but once we've written half the debt off, which is very painful, then the balancing debt can be supported by Greece with the aid of reforms. All right, All right then, Wiener, as the person responsible for individual money, people that have investments, when you hear that there's no news out of Europe, and we describe that as being a good thing for no the market. No news is good news. No news is Absolutely. good news. Stocks go up. What we saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average up more than two percent, almost two and a half percent today. Is that the kind of investing climate that makes people want to put more money to work? No, in the absolutely not. It, it is not an investment climate where people are feeling secure. We've got, had tremendous volatility uh, every day this month, just in October. The spread from the highs to lows in the Dow have been one and a half to four percent every day. I mean, we're seeing hundred, multi-hundred point moves in the Dow every day. Investors are really nervous. The problem is that they look at the overall market. What we're very interested in is we've found a couple places where actually spreads are making us feel very comfortable. There is the spread in valuations between very large cap, multinational, uh, multinational budget, uh, battleship balance sheet companies and the small guys. There is a spread between the earnings yield on stocks, the market in general, and the yield on treasuries. And then there is a spread between the yield on treasuries and high yield junk bonds. We particularly like high quality, we, we like the high quality junk. If, if that's not a misnomer, but we think that that spread has widened out. It did widen out enough that we wanted to put some money there. And I saw a report in the, uh, in the paper today that uh, there's been a lot of money flowing into high yield the last week or so. Indeed. Our Darren Osamogu, come in on the topic of money going into various corporations. I want to get your thoughts now on bank recapitalizations taking place in Europe and what this would mean for U.S. investors. First of all, do you think the banks are going to be able to pull it off? Well, I mean, I think it's uh, it's great news that there is bank bank recapitalization. I think that's a very important element of what's going on in Europe. I think uh, the news that from Europe is good uh, in, in in that politicians are taking an action at the end. But at the, I think it's important to distinguish between two problems that exist at the moment in Europe and to some degree in the United States as well. One is the one that investors are reacting to right now, which is that EFSF and European policymakers are taking action about ring fencing uh, Italy and. Spain. 
Spain and uh, defending Euro, and I think that's a good thing. But there are important structural problems, uh, and <clears throat> the Greek debt is uh, a big structural problem both for Greece itself and for Europe in, in general. And I think it's going to be a, a major hurdle for growth down the line. I think it's unavoidable that there has to be some restructuring of Greek debt, a major restructuring, if you want to call it default. And a big barrier to that is the politicians' perception, or perhaps the reality of it, that the banking system is not able to withstand that. So if the banks are recapitalized, that opens the door for a more comprehensive solution to the problem. And it reduces the likelihood that's become very high, to be, to, to be frank, that we're going to, be, to have a lost decade in Europe and certainly in Greece. And I think there is a similar issue issue in, in the United States as well. So that's why it's important to deal with the structural problems in the United States also. Well, let me bring in Christina Romer. Professor Romer, what can the Europeans learn about our own experience in the United States dealing with bank capital issues and a foundering financial system? Uh, well, I think Daron is absolutely correct that bank recapitalization is incredibly important. And I think we come back to the issue of sort of how much. I mean, there's a big debate going on in Europe now about whether uh, the banks only need $80 billion of more capital, or is it, in fact, somewhere between 200 and 300 billion? And I think the real fear is they, you know, as they recapitalize, they won't recapitalize enough so that they can withstand what I think we all realize is going to Coming, which is Greek is going to have Greece is going to have to write down its debt, and so that is going to put a strain on the banking system. And so uh, certainly this weekend, as people are discussing and coming up with a plan, making sure there's enough extra capital is going to be very important. Arnab, you've been an advisor to former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, so you have some idea of the way the conversations take place between leaders. Do you think that they're cognizant? of the potential risks for a pullback in bank lending because European banks, as you just described, 50 percent of loans to Latin American corporations come from Europe. Over 90 percent of the loans made to companies in Eastern Europe come from Eurozone banks. And you've had experience in the past about bank lending. You're quite right. The two or three things to observe. First of all, that the lending by European banks to emerging markets is three times the combined lending of the US and Japan put together. So the exposure is huge to the emerging markets. And if they should be forced to delever, then it has an impact on, on those markets. So this is central. The second point to note is that when you're, um, the Germans or the French are saving Greece, they're actually saving their own banks. That's what they're doing. Uh, because the default affects their own banking system, and we should acknowledge that these countries are really saving their own developed banks. Now, the third point, which is you, you, which you brought up, was well, how do politicians operate in this environment? And they negotiate, and they negotiate hard, and there's a tendency to run things all the way down to the sort of uh, the the eleventh hour and, and and the 59th minute. And this is really dangerous. Now, the other day, I spoke to a friend of mine who's a very senior diplomat, and I asked. You know, does uh, Angela Merkel get it? And he said, what well, he was speaking to the German ambassador who told him she does. She knows clearly what's at stake. I don't know whether she did before, but she really does. So I, I take great comfort from that. So what, what we have now is a process of negotiation between the two most powerful people in Europe uh, within this, which is the, the, the Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy. Now, there are differences between them, and they will negotiate to the, to the uh, uh, 59th minute, but I hope that they will arrive at a conclusion because they know what is at stake, and that's their own banking system. Christina Roma, come in on the topic of policymakers. Uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, he has spent quite a bit of time with European finance officials. What do you think the U.S.'s political role is in Europe right now? You know, I think at this point, when, when Secretary Geithner uh, took his trip to Europe recently, I think there was a certain amount of, who are you to be telling us what to do? Go home and get your own house in order. And I feel that so incredibly strongly that right now the way the United States could be the most helpful would be, in fact, to be being a leader to the world on showing what good policy would be. And I think we are failing terribly on that dimension. So, you know, we saw today that, that one of the pieces, another of the pieces of the, of the president 
president's jobs package uh, did not make it past a hurdle in the Senate, so we're not doing anything to get growth going in the short run. And we still have a terrible long-run budget deficit that we haven't put into place uh, a plan for really getting it down. I think, you know, that's the model for what needs to happen everywhere is measures to promote growth today and getting the deficit down over time. The best thing the United States could be doing is leading by example. And uh, right now, the Congress is, is preventing the president from doing that. Darren Asamoglu, do you have any hope for the, Euro, the, the United States uh, Deficit Reduction Committee? They're supposed to come out with some proposals just before Thanksgiving? Well, they have an impossible task. I think the political will is not there and, uh, and nobody agrees on what needs to be cut. But I think it's also very important, and I agree here entirely with Christy, is that the most important thing is for the United States to be a global leader and get the economy going, get growth going. And for that, you know, we need something like Obama's job package or some action from the government on the fiscal front, just relying on the Fed for a third quantitative, the third round of quantitative easing or something else is not going to be sufficient. I think it's very, very important that whatever expansion comes now, it is associated with a comprehensive and intelligent plan for future tightening because the level of deficit that the United States has, especially when you take into account the long run consequences of all of these unpaid entitlements is very serious. And I think just posturing on that is not going to be enough. But I'm not very optimistic that any short-term solution, any solution will be produced within the next month or so, because the problems Dan, are just too Dan, hard and let, there is too much Let me come in, to you, Dan. We're going to come in on this topic of what do investors do as we head into this Thanksgiving deadline for the Deficit Reduction Committee? More volatility for markets? Oh, absolutely more volatility. I don't think an investor goes and, and whipsaws their portfolio around as a result. But I think uh, what I told our clients uh, about a month ago was get used to it. The volatility is here. This, is, this isn't 2008, but it's 2009 in terms of the volatility. Things calmed down a little last year. We're back at it right now. And, and it's uncomfortable. It, uh, but all that intraday volatility in the end is not as important as what happens over a month, three months, six months, nine months, and there are values in the market. I mean, you just have to be an investor, not a trader. we got to leave it there. Dan Wiener, thank you very much. Professor Christina Romer, Darren Asamoglu, and Arnab Banerjee. Thank you very much.